Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Collins, and I'm a senior relationship manager with Key Private Bank, and I will be your monitor, uh, moderator for today. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar entitled, entitled How Nonprofits Can Survive and Thrive in a Challenging Year. We hope that this will be the first of many jointly produced informational webinars between Grants Plus and Key Bank. Before we officially kick off the panel discussion, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, this is a recorded event. So for those of you who would like to review today's information or refer other individuals to today's call, we'll provide information for listening to the recording. Um, second, we really want this event to be as interactive as possible. However, with almost 500 participants, and thank you everyone, it shows that this is information that's really needed. Um, we just can't open up the lines for live questions. However, we do wanna give everyone a chance uh, to ask questions. Therefore, we're gonna offer you two opportunities to do so. Um, your first opportunity is throughout the panel discussion itself. Um, as you'll see on the slide on the screen, all participants can write in questions, which um, our behind the scenes technology guru, Matt, will push to me throughout the event. And then your second opportunity to ask questions will come at the end of today's discussion, where you'll have the ability to write in questions using the same process on the screen. The third housekeeping item, as we give, begin to think about future events, um, we want our discussions to address areas that are most important to you. Um, therefore, right before we move into the Q&A portion at the end of um, our discussion, we're gonna put up a single polling question that will allow you to select the topics that are most important to you and you'd like to hear more about. We'll tabulate those results and share them in real time before we move into the Q&A. Um, and then we'll use those results to help shape our future, our future webinars. And lastly, following our Q&A, we will provide all panel members contact information. So if you have specific questions or wanna reach out um, today uh, to anyone on today's call, you'll be able to do so. So, okay, let's get started. And we'll start with the introduction of our phenomenal and I say knowledgeable panelists. I'm gonna introduce each panel member alphabetically. So no favoritism for my key colleagues. And then we'll just ask each of them to provide a brief summary of their background. So we're gonna kick it off with okay. Dale Robinson Anglin, Program Director for Youth, Health and Human Services at the Cleveland Foundation. Good afternoon, Dale. Thank you, Tracy. So nice to be here. Um, I've been at the foundation now for three years, working in philanthropy for almost 15 years. I help lead our COVID fund and I'm happy to be on the panel today. Thank you, Dale. And next up is Marvin Devers, Senior Investment Officer for Institutional Investment Services at Key Bank. Hi, Marvin. Hi, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Marvin Devers. I'm a Senior Institutional Investment Officer with Key Bank. I work with our institutional clients to help them structure investment portfolios that are designed to meet their objectives, as well as guiding on uh, spending policy, risk tolerance, and other areas of governance. Thank you, Marvin. And next up is Cynthia McDonald, who I'll call Cindy throughout today's uh, webinar. She is Senior Vice President and National Director of Philanthropic Planning at Key Bank. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everybody. Like Tracy said, my name is Cindy McDonald, and I am the National Director of Philanthropic uh, Planning with Key Institutional Advisors. I've been with Key 28 years working with not-for-profits and helping strengthen donor relations through complex gifting strategies, providing thought leadership and advice around funding, sustainability, and governance of planned giving programs, and I also nationally lead our advisory and administrative offerings in the pooled special needs trust space. So happy to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Next up is Lauren Steiner, president and founder of Grants Plus, which is our co-host for today's event. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks so much to KeyBank for partnering with us on this event, hopefully the first of many. Um, and at Grants Plus, we help organizations improve their grant seeking, and that can be through singular proposal writing, uh, foundation research, and grant strategy. And uh, we've been doing this since 2007. We've got 20 consultants, and they're located in our home state of Ohio, and we do work all around the country. Thank you, Lauren. And next up is Deborah Obert thomas President and CEO of Philanthropy Ohio. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, Philanthropy Ohio is a statewide membership association uh, that provides the network tools and knowledge to help people engaged in philanthropy become more effective, powerful change agents in their communities. I've been with the organization for six years, um, this past year as president and CEO, and I'm, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Deborah. And last but certainly not least, we have Karen White, 
Um, she is Senior Vice President of Corporate Responsibility and Community Relations at Key Bank. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Tracy, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Uh, like my colleagues, I've been with Key for some time, uh, in fact, nearly 20 years, uh, primarily serving with the Key Bank Foundation as a senior program officer for most of that time. Uh, recently, I've transitioned to focus on community relations in Northeast Ohio, and I also continue to oversee several of the company's large corporate initiatives nationwide. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. So let's kick off our discussion with one question for all of the panelists. Um, what is the most frequent question or most frequent concern that you're hearing from your nonprofit clients as they try to navigate the current environment? And this time, I think we're going to go in reverse order from our introduction. So Karen, that means we kick it off with you. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, I'd have to say that COVID-19 obviously has increased the need for temporary financial assistance at unprecedented levels. And at the same time, many nonprofits have had to reduce their staffing due to budget shortfalls. So the net result is a community with very high levels of need, but fewer nonprofit staff to respond to help. This leaves nonprofits um, looking for creative ways to gain the expertise or advice they need to succeed. So in other words, um, how might they be looking at their volunteer base or their funder relationships to enhance their operational needs, such as marketing, communications, web design, strategy, and so on. Great. And Deborah, what are you hearing? Well, I would say on top of the crisis of COVID, um, we're hearing a lot about racial equity um, and racial unrest in our in our country, in our communities. Um, and it's something that we can't ignore. It's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and it, that for nonprofits, it's filtering from program staff who are, are um, on the ground to the board level and, and the requirement for leadership to really lean in and um, learn about how they can uh, address these issues in their communities. Great, thanks, Deborah. And Lauren, what about you? You know, um, I'm hearing a lot about 2021. I think that, you know, we are nearing the end of 2020. And I think that the fundraising, um, you know, to some degree is, is, uh, is now in the books and we're looking at 2021 and organizations are asking us, you know, what, where are, is grant seeking going? Where are grants going to be in 2021? What kind of levels to expect? That's what I'm hearing a lot of. Great. And Cindy, and you? So a lot of frequent questions, concerns, conversations I'm having with a lot of not-for-profits are around revenue resources and how they're changing. So those in-person events flipping to virtual events. And you know we, they've had six, seven months now where they've actually acclimated to that. But what does, Lauren, to your point, what does 2021 look like? What does the next one, two, three years look like for the fundraising aspect? Will it be virtual? Will we ever get back to in-person events? And then what else can nonprofits do to raise funds? So you know, having a high level understanding of these tax acts, such as the SECURE Act and the CARES Act and how they can engage with conversations around donors, they're seeking advice around this. So having a lot of discussion, a really a lot of great discussion too, so. And Marvin, what about you? Yes, the biggest question we're hearing is that given kind of the current market environments, uh, low rates, how do we need to think about our portfolios? How should we be adapting um, our portfolios to help us continue to support our spending policy? So thinking about asset allocation, investment policy statements, and how we work together with our advisors to restructure portfolios to meet those challenges and help uh, nonprofits really accomplish their mission and objectives. Perfect. And Dale, are you hearing anything different than what's already been discussed? I'll just add all of that. Plus, um, we're hearing that, you know, it's hard for organizations, given the changes that are happening so quickly, attach themselves to a particular project. Normally, they come to a foundation for project support. Um, and those projects are shifting quickly, um, not all of their own making. And so I know we're, we're being asked the question, can they turn those project grants into general operating grants? Or can they even just come to us for general operating grants? The answer, by the way, is yes. Um, but I know that's a conversation they're, ha they're having to have with a lot of different foundations and they should feel comfortable moving from project to general operating support conversations. So, so if, I, if I'm hearing all of you correctly and, and you all might be coming at it from a slightly different angle, what I'm hearing in general is that nonprofits 
have been facing eight months of unprecedented and uncertain circumstances. And not knowing how much longer, and I'll just call it this craziness, will last, um, they, like so many of us, just want to know what they can begin to do to take back control to be more proactive than reactive to what's happening around them and be better positioned for uh, 2021 and beyond. Would you say that's correct? Yes. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say that's correct. Okay. So uh, there are three primary issues that are aff affecting not only um, our communities, but the overall country. Um, one is COVID. Um, there's the increased awareness and discussion around, ra around racial inequality. And of course, the highly um, energized political climate. Is there any one of these that's more important or more impactful to nonprofits than the uh, other two? I'll just put out to the general panel. So I'll start. Um, you know, I, I would say they're all important for different reasons. Depends on the type of organization or industry that you're in. Um, but, you know, COVID has affected every nonprofit. It does not matter what what you provide to people, right? Period. Um, it, it affects your fundraising, even the arts, it's affected everything. Um, racial equity, when we went out and asked people about how we did with our COVID phase one, the racial equity issue is what came up actually, because that was so clearly, ex you know, just exacerbated and, and, and made bare by the COVID fund. And for a lot of our nonprofits, to be frank, no matter who gets in for the election, what happens at the federal level and at the state level still affects policy-wise the environment that they're operating in. And so it's all important. And it's why I think nonprofits are, all of us are reeling because it's not just one crisis, it's multiple crises that you're dealing with at the same time. Yeah, I would just say that it's kind of a whole new world this fall and winter than it was, you know, a, a year ago at this time, I think. and it's still evolving and um, nonprofit leaders are really having to do kind of back bends and somersaults to adapt. And um, it's just a, you know, I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion is because there's just a lot going on. And so there's a lot of uh, ways to maybe try to handle some of it. From, uh, from an investment perspective, we really look at the potential for social issues to have a longer lasting impact. Uh, when we think about the election, that's really short term. Uh, we'll have an event, the outcome will be will be known, and then markets will adapt to whichever party is in that White House. With COVID, we at least knock on wood, hope that this is going to terminate sometime in the next year, year and a half with the, the arrival of the vaccine and the permanence of that. But when we think about the impact of social change on investment portfolios, it's really the ability for nonprofits uh, and other institutions to have that filter into their portfolios, looking at not just social issues, but environmental and governance issues and how you invest in utilizing ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance in their investment process to identify companies that are having a positive impact on, on the communities and on the environment and have the proper governance structure in place. So really it's that, that continuation of this idea of change and broader um, broader community that can have a, a bigger impact longer term in the investment world. Right. So let, let's just start breaking it down a little bit. Since COVID, racial inequality, and the election are really not under the direct control of any one organization, let's start with something that's a little bit more internal, something where management teams and boards can take more immediate action and hopefully see some more immediate results. So let's talk finances. And let's look at finances from a couple of different perspectives. Um, we can talk about fundraising, donor engagement and giving, and then the overall fiscal strategy that um, organizations can put in place. And Marvin, you said that the number one question that you are hearing right now has to do with the positioning of investment portfolios, especially when incoming cash flow is not as strong and in markets where returns might be a little lower than we'd like. So what are you advising organizations to do? That's a great question. It's really one we, we come across often is in today's market, when we think about fixed income and its potential moving forward of yielding low one to 2% returns, that's usually been a broad portion of, a, of client portfolios. You know, the broad consensus has been around the 60, 40 for clients going back decades. But moving forward, we have to acknowledge that a large portion, if you had that allocation, would have limited impact on returns. And so 
what we're working with clients to do is to revisit investment policy statements. These are often documents that don't get touched for several years, but we think of them as living documents, something that needs to be reviewed on an annual basis. So we're talking with clients, looking at the asset allocation and having the conversation of saying, well, the way your portfolio is structured now is it's not going to continue to meet your spending needs for the next 10 years. So what do we do? What are some different areas that we can look at? And in short, it's really requiring nonprofits to push out on the risk curve, to take on more risk, to generate higher returns, to maintain the spending that they've had. But it really focuses around investment policy conversations and what organizations can sustain from a risk perspective. Gotcha. So, so are you talking about a need to revisit really the long-term investment strategy, or is this more a short-term change in response to what we're seeing today? Uh, this is a long-term strategy shift, knowing that, uh, again, with maybe 30, 40 percent of your portfolio generating one to two percent, you're going to require or need those, those other asset classes to carry a lot of the load to get you to the six and seven percent returns that organizations need to sustain uh, to have spending in that four to five percent range. I want to go back to something you said, too, on ESG investing. And, and historically, I think a lot of people equate ESG investing, being socially responsible, as being into areas that maybe are, are providing lower returns than what a generalized portfolio might do. Can you address that question a little bit? Yeah, in the past, really, it would began as socially responsible investing, which was restricting the companies that you invested in um, and aligning that with the mission. But over time, that's really transitioned into what we refer to as ESG, which is being proactive. That is finding companies that, again, are making positive changes as it relates to environmental, social, and governance issue that improves their bottom line, that increases their profitability and helps them generate returns that are higher than other companies in the same space are doing. So we're now looking to achieve market returns that are, or returns that are above market as opposed to just stepping back and restricting those companies uh, that we're investing in. So it's, it's really shifted over the last 20 years to being more proactive and having an impact on companies in the way we spend and invest our dollars. Great. Thank you. So let's shift gears a little bit. You know, Marvin really talked about money that's already on the back balance sheet. Um, what about the um, challenges of bringing in new funds in today's environment? You know, we've all heard the stories of organizations that are trying to find different funding sources this year. Um, I, I guess my question would be, is funding still available? You know, whether it's from donor gifts, fundraisers, or grant writing, or, or is everyone in this environment just simply tapped out? I think the short answer to that is that funding is still available. Um, you know, smart fundraising has always made sense, but uh, makes sense so much now. You know, it's more than more than ever um, important that organizations be efficient with their strategies. But there are individuals who are giving. There are certainly foundations who are giving. Um, they're looking at. We're looking at a 2020, um, which is on par with previous years because of some of the increases in giving that happened in the spring. So. Yeah, the short answer is yes, it is, the, it is time to do efficient fundraising, absolutely. What about a donor, yeah, well, on the, on, from a donor perspective, so thinking about along the lines of that, so it's really important that effective donor communication is still happening with, with our not-for-profits reaching out and communicating with their donor base and their communities in which they thrive, you know, that they're still here, their programs are still a vital part of the communities in which they serve. And nonprofits, um, a lot of the conversations I've had and just discussions around, you know, creating effective di digital communication and social media strategies. And these nonprofits are pivoting from those in-person events to everything's got to be more or less electronic nowadays. So what does that look like? And for some, dependent upon the type of nonprofits that you are pairing that with, you know, the possibility of some socially distanced in-person um, volunteerism. So you think about food banks, there's got to be some kind of in-person happening there but you know having the effective communication strategy is what a lot of a lot of not-for-profits are focusing on as well to engage with their donors and i just okay. add that um you know although many foundations may their budgets may have stopped for 2020 they're gearing up for 2021 and many foundations have given out more this year than in previous years um, and so they're they're trying to figure out their balance too of managing their assets and giving out support but I just say, stay in touch with your program officer. Um, and as usual, which was always best advice even before COVID, is you have to research every foundation. They're all different. 
Um, they're all different in how they want to be um, so talked to, um, kept in touch with. You have to do that more now. And so it might be that instead of just one person's job in your organization, the one development officer, maybe you give it to several people um, because this is so important. Um, but that communications is still very important. Um, and many of us are still giving out dollars. And Dale, I'm just... Oh, go ahead, oh, Deborah. If I could just piggyback on what Dale is saying and re-emphasize um, how important relationship building is when you're when you're working with your, your institutional funders. Um, you know, communicating authentically about the challenges you've been facing, how you're strategically pivoting your operations and preparing for what's next. Recognizing that our you know next normal is likely not getting back to pre-COVID modes. Um, so being able to articulate you know where and how you're striving to be. Um, you know considering the usual power dynamics between funders and their nonprofit partners won't change until the field systematically changes. And that may take some time, but the crisis has affected everyone and funders are, as Dale said, are stretching to meet growing demand and their approach is, is changing as well. Um, in things that were previously thought to be unconventional, um, they're encouraging, to, we're encouraging our members to take a values-based approach um, going forward. So trust-based philanthropy, which does center around relationships. And it leads to um, trust and practicing principles such as giving multi-year unrestricted funding, simplifying this and streamlining the paperwork, um, both for the ask and for the reporting, and being transparent and responsive and offering support beyond um, writing checks. I want to say one thing about, about relationships, if I could. Um, you know, there's been there's a, a maybe a, a deep tradition in philanthropy that it's sort of like all in who you know, right? And um, I mean, in some to some degree, that can be true, um, but there are some things that are equally as important, and that is one is alignment with the funder, and so that that is about if what you are doing is aligned with what that foundation is interested in, and every foundation is interested in some sort of ecosystem of activity, right? And so if what you're doing is aligned with what that foundation is interested in, you have that a lot, you have that alignment, and that's really key. And then the other piece to relationships, I think, is equity. Because I think, you know, while in the past philanthropy has been guilty of, you know, sort of giving to to friends, right? Uh, oh, we know this person very well. They're gonna they're gonna be great with the money. We'll just give them a fifty thousand dollar grant or whatever it is. I think now more than ever, foundations are very concerned with an equitable approach, and so that may mean giving to organizations that are unproven, uh, black led organizations that haven't had a long track record of of grant support. Um, so there are opportunities out there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that you have um, this deep uh, network with philanthropic context. If you have alignment, then you know you can be be in this in this grants game. I would add to that, Lauren, and I, I agree with that. I think that the relationship, however, is so important from a perspective of um, just outreach. So maybe you you've built a relationship with a funder and you want to call them to discuss. Um, you know, thoughts, and maybe their answer is no, um, but because you've built that relationship, you come away with a, a better understanding of why, because you can have those um, uh, authentic and honest conversations, and then, um, it, and sometimes that understanding is sometimes better than a yes, because then you can take that information and use it um, to approach others that it may be in alignment with, and that funder that you have a relationship with may also be able to help you uncover those other opportunities um, that may be aligned with your need. Now, I, I wanna just go back real quick to, to the, um, Marvin talked about the long-term with the um, investments, but in a short-term budget um, perspective, one of the things too that um, we all know, nonprofits tend to sometimes have mission creep based on a funder's or a donor's preference or the board's preference and where they want them to go. And that, that mission creep may come away from the, uh, the focus of the organization, the original focus of the organization. So I think too, in planning for 2021, part of what a nonprofit needs to do is really go back and look at what haven't they been doing in 2020 because of all this disruption and where those things 
nice to have or were they necessary to their mission? If, if they were nice to have, really make those critical hard decisions as to whether they move forward with them in 2021. And Dale, I want to circle back to you for just a second. You know, the Cleveland Foundation has such a broad reach in Northeast Ohio, um, supporting many different types of organizations and causes. From what you're seeing, are there certain types of organizations um, or areas of need that are having a more difficult time getting funding? And, and what I'm thinking about is it seems like healthcare is getting a lot of attention. It's a big focus. Um, homelessness is a big focus. Education. But what about some of the softer areas like the arts? Yeah, so they're they're not easy to, easy conversations to have, um, and I would say at the Cleveland Foundation, luckily we're large enough with so many donors have given us money over the decades um, that we are able to do a both and. Um, we've been supporting our we many people know we have our we support along with many other funders the COVID phase one and now phase two um, with the portal by the way just opened last week. Um, and so we're doing that um, with our partners. Um, we're also doing, continuing to do our internal TCF grant making. We'll be giving out probably at the end of this year more than we've probably ever given out. Um, and we're trying to be frank, to not pick our favorite child. Um, they're all important. We know that. Um, we're just trying to figure out how much to give to who for when. Um, so yes, health and human services has been taking the bulk right now. That's definitely the case. But we also know, and I'm not the arts person, but I'll speak for my arts person. Arts is about economic development here in our, in our region. Um, they are incredibly important. It employs so many people. It brings so much revenue to the city and to our region. We have to also do that. So they're continuing the Minority Arts Education Fund. Um, they didn't stop that, they could have, um, but I think those applications just came open. Um, so we may not be sometimes giving at the level that people might want from us, um, but we're trying not to rule out yet any particular area um, because we know that they're all important um, for different reasons. Right. Anyone like to add to that of what you're experiencing or, or hearing? Okay. We do have an audience question and I'm gonna ask Matt if you could put up the slide one more time just instructing folks how they write in questions that they'd like. Um, question comes from Angela Melvin, and the question is, how has COVID impacted foundation and donors' abilities to give? Um, Who would like to take that? And I can please. touch on the donor side. So the, with the question from understanding, so saying that COVID, how it's impacting on donors and how the, which ways to give, it's just actually, I've had more conversations in the past couple of weeks more so because one we're, we're rolling up on year end and donors are looking to to give and how can they do it they're thinking more outside the box so it's more than just a cash or stock or bond type of gift that donors are looking at they're looking at more complex strategies in which they can fulfill their philanthropic intent really they you know a lot of the donor like what motivates a donor is the leadership of the organization so that they know that the stu the funds are being stewarded well and they're actually being applied to what the donor really would like to see and so I'm seeing a lot of charitable lead trusts as more so as remainder trusts and being funded with more than just cash stocks and bonds but but more complex assets such as real estate mm -hmm. so I'm really seeing a push on that right now and um, and not-for-profits are reaching out for seeking advice on how to really get that accomplished before year end. But again, it's donors really are reaching out to really look at what else can we gift to make our, um, to help the not-for-profit organizations in which they support. One other thing is that uh, Giving Tuesday, moving up Giving Tuesday the way they did uh, into the spring um, it resulted in one of the largest springs uh, for giving that I think we've ever seen. Normally, uh, individual giving is really concentrated towards the end of the year, and we had this uptick early in the year, so it was a really um, unique year, and I think that demonstrates to me that a lot of people found, individuals found meaning through this crisis by by giving. Yeah, you know, and I, I'd like to just um, a, a plug for KeyBank Foundation. So at the beginning of the um, crisis, uh, KeyBank Foundation did pivot quite quickly and made contributions across the United States of a million dollars in various funds, such as the uh, Rapid Relief Fund at, at the Cleveland Foundation, of which we 
we're a donor there. And then on top of that, for internally and to give our employees uh, the opportunity to also respond, um, uh, they, KeyBank Foundation took the matching gift program from a one-to-one -one match and made it a two-to-one match, uh, lifting the cap. Uh, the normal cap for employees, and that raised another half million dollars for nonprofits across uh, the United States. So, um, you know, not to to say KeyBank is the only organization that's done that. Organizations across the uh, the country have had similar response. But I think um, you know you really see. Um, some really great stuff. People step up to the plate and they're innovative. Uh, funders are being innovative in how they're responding. I'll just add that, you know, half, uh, I work on the program team with the Cleveland Foundation and we give out half the money. Half of our $100 million or so that we give out every year comes through our individual donors. And if you look at that, and I, I don't control that side, but if you look at that side, actually more dollars have flowed through that. They have given more to their donor advised funds and more has come out from those donor advised funds to grantees just in the last six months. And so people are still giving and they're reaching in deep. Um, you know, of course we always need more, but just know that the, it is not dropped off. People have responded, people with means have responded and we're expecting them to continue to respond. I'd like to add to that too, the responses coming from foundations, um, similar to, to the example that, that Karen and, and both Dale have raised, um, have been innovative and also thinking about collaborative funds um, and how they are coming together um, to have greater impact. Uh, we have a statewide fund called the Ohio Collaborative for Educating Remotely to help support um, districts in education that are really struggling with virtual learning. And we were able to raise from our foundation members um, almost a million and a half, and that was matched by the state three to one. So thinking of these creative ways that, that um, tr traditional institutional funding can then um, really step up and meet the needs. We have another writing question, which I think is really interesting given what we're talking about. And, and the question is, what is the likelihood of unrestricted funds being provided to not-for-profits versus a program focus? And a second part to that question is, is there any legislative discussion regarding increasing foundations grant distribution, say not 5%, but maybe a higher amount? Any thoughts on that? Um, I can say that, you know, D Dale um, uh, gave us an example and she and she said it too. If you know one funder, you know one funder. But the Cleveland Foundation is open now to providing unrestricted operating dollars. It's a, it's welcome news. It's it's wonderful. And maybe Deborah can comment on if other foundations in Ohio are doing that. But we are hearing it across the country. Um, certainly much more talk about it than maybe ever before. Um, regarding the second question about increasing foundation grant distribution, uh, the percentages, I haven't heard of any uh, legislation being introduced. There's been talk about it. There's op-eds about it all the time. Um, there is, however, some legislation that has been introduced about um, some restrictions on or um, some requirements on giving to donor from from giving from donor advised funds. So that's very new. That um, there's also been talk about that for a long time, but there's now legislation been introduced. So it's at the very early stages, and I don't know that anybody is um, thinking it's going to go through the way it is, but it's, um, it's something to watch. And I thought, Lauren, um, I thought that 5% was the minimum and that foundations are able to decide because I think uh, Cleveland Foundation does uh, on occasion do 8%, uh, 6 to 8%. So I, I thought that question was um, uh, the not the answer, but... Uh, an observation is that 5% is the minimum and they, they have their freedom to do more. And I, I just say in general, if you look at the philanthropy across the country, the minute COVID hit, um, the word went out to everybody, whether you were community foundation, private, uh, individual is you're gonna need to give more. Um, and you're gonna need to at a minimum, change your reporting requirements, loosen them um, give more general operating support. Um, so that's a conversation that's happening throughout the entire sector. Many, many, many foundations have embraced it. The question is, are they going to, is it time limited or are they going to do it, f you know, going forward for longer? And that's a conversation you should have with your foundation. Um, I know at, at the Cleveland Foundation, we just had the conversation this morning. 
Um, we are very much in favor of doing more general operating grants. Um, it's really okay to come with us with that request. Yeah, you know, and early on, KeyBank, uh, again, KeyBank Foundation did reach out to those funders that were multi-year and um, uh, had, because of the relationships that are built, had those conversations saying, hey, we'll unrestrict these funds if you need them for employee hardship or you need them for other COVID response as well. And I'm sure there's uh, organizations across the United States that have been similar. Some of the work we're doing with uh, nonprofits as it relates to utilizing their investment portfolios is also helping them or advising them on establishing lines of credit with their financial, in financial institutions. What this allows them to do is borrow at extremely low rates and in this particular environment, give more with the idea that your investment portfolio should be yielding much higher returns than what you're borrowing at. So you're able to continue to grow your asset base without spending it down by utilizing low cost uh, financing from your institution and in, that you're, you're working with. Great idea, Marvin. Leveraging the investment portfolio. Um, let, let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk about fundraising, um, especially in a COVID. It's been extremely challenging this year. And for many organizations, you know, they count on that at one or two big events drive a significant portion of their annual revenue. Um, but in co under the COVID um, umbrella, those tried and true events, the ones that donors really look forward to and expect, whether they be the fashion shows, the galas, or the large dinners, just aren't possible. Um, there was a survey um, done that said 86% of nonprofits in the U.S. have canceled their in-person events completely. So let's start with Cindy and Karen. Um, what are you guys hearing from your clients about what they're doing or not doing this year? Are the events still taking place and going virtual or are they canceling the events altogether? So I, I'll jump in first is that I, so a lot of our not-for-profit clients actually did take the risk and flipped to virtual because they need the funds. So even though they may not have uh, achieved the same dollar amount that they would have if it was an in-person event, they got really creative. And I'll just share two um, really neat ways a virtual event kind of took place and really uh, engaged a lot of uh, donors was one, it was uh, a partnership with an online auction house and artwork. And actually the not-for-profit partnered with them and they provided for a whole week, a scenario of, I think it was about 300 pieces of art that the donors were allowed to, to bid on. And then as you won, 50% of the proceeds actually went to the not-for-profit. So it wasn't like a dial in here, this is the one hour event and you're focused in, but it gave the donor a lot, and a lot of time of a week to kind of peruse through the website. So, you know, and, and then go ahead and bid on that particular item. It was a great partnership because it helped not only the um, the art community, but it also helped the not-for-profit. And then another was a humane society that actually had, uh, they did do a gala. They flipped it and they actually partnered with a local restaurant, which was wonderful because it kept the, you know, provided business to that local restaurant where for, I think it was $100, they could go and pick up their their dinner, their gala dinner, and then go home and sit. And then for an hour, they went and presented, um, you know, the, the programs that they were trying to support and raise funds, and they did it right online. Uh, so they were able to support a local restaurant. They were able to raise some funds for their programs at the Humane Society with success. And Karen, you had a really interesting one with a, a, a virtual walk. Yeah, um, yeah. Go so, ahead. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, of course, in the early months, there was a lot of learning going on as people mm -hmm. were trying to shift from in-person to virtual. Some events worked, some events didn't work so well, but every event that every nonprofit did was with, um, uh, it was authentic and it was within the means that they had available uh, at that time. Um, one of the funnest uh, events uh, that I think I attended early on was a, a virtual walk um, where um, really there was nobody there, but the executive director of the organization did the entire route of the walk um, with some of the staff uh, along the way, you know, cheering, um, but had the phone up and did this virtual walk. He felt it was light, it was fun, and I think he felt really connected. Um, to the mission of the organization uh, that way. Um, another example of an event that um, typically uh, draws 7,500, uh, 6,000 to 7,500 people downtown. It's a Cuyahoga Community College um, Jazz Festival. It's a ticketed event. 
This year they went viral. It was free and open to the public. They reached 100,000 people, right? Um, so while that was an expense to them to do the uh, event virtually, think about all of the outreach that they had in those connection points that really helped build relationships or future relationships for the organization. So even if organizations are shifting to virtual and maybe they're doing it free because they've gotten sponsors to help with the, the back end cost, um, by having a free event, you're potentially gaining new future donors. Uh, so I, I don't think um, that that should be uh, discounted, how important that is to uh, get that outreach for your mission. And I think it's really important that um, executive directors and, and the you know leadership within a nonprofit organization really truly understand their budget and their revenue resources and, and understanding if some have dried up where they can seek others. They all know that um, you know their plan giving programs within are the pipeline that feed their endowment that support the mission. You know, a lot of these organizations look to how can I create a steady stream that is a revenue resource. It is it is true and tried that income that supports their their the programs in which they support their communities. So it's really understanding. So internally looking within and saying, OK, for 2021, what does my budget look like? Because right now everybody's putting pen to paper and trying to figure out where the funds are coming from today, October, <laughs> because year end will be here before we know it. Mm -hmm. And I will add that individual giving, you know, we hear a lot about major gifts and a lot of focus on major gifts. We hear a lot about events, fundraising, but there's this whole swath of giving that is sort of in the middle of that, um, of that, you know, the annual fund giver who gives a hundred or a thousand dollars in a year. And the, the real future that I'm hearing about individual giving is ongoing monthly commitments. And, you know, what if you, you, you know, saved money because you, you didn't, let's say you saved money. I don't know if that's true, but you, because you didn't have an event. And so you had a virtual event that raised a little bit less, but what if you focus that effort on getting a hundred, $100 a month donors to your organization that not only creates an evergreen source of funding for your organization, but creates a beautiful pipeline to plan giving what Cindy is talking about. You know, it's the, it's the ongoing givers who are going to be, be ripe for that kind of planned ultimate gift. And, um, you know, I think that mid-level sometimes does, it's not uh, as, as sexy or something, uh, you know, to pay attention to, but it's super important for nonprofits. Um, you know, Tracy, there was a question in the in the chat, not the Q&A, but it asked, does the panel have advice on how to fundraise from corporate community at this time? And is there interest in sponsorships for virtual events? So what I would say to that is early on, um, you know, we built our budget, our uh, sponsorship budget for 2020, and we had earmarked funds for events that we knew were going to happen in 2020, and then March hit. And so... Um, where we had made those commitments already, um, we went ahead and kept that commitment. I mean, it, it, it is a commitment and it goes back to that relationship, right? You've built relationship with nonprofits and if you've made a commitment as a corporation and, and I, I don't speak for all corporations, but I have the sense that most corporations kept those commitments um, going forward. Uh, is there an interest in sponsorships for virtual events? Well, I've seen nonprofits now um, being able to pivot so that there's still value to a corporation uh, in a sponsorship. We have uh, a sponsorship of a, a virtual celebration coming up where our CEO did a, you know, a, a two minute um, video. And so there's a lot of video requests coming over now. Um, because that seems to be the, you know, the thing to do. But I think there is still value in it. So I think you should still ask corporations for their sponsorship. In addition we to corporations with their sponsorships, don't forget, like a lot of corporations will do gift matching. So to their employees. So you think of the larger corporations with a couple of thousand employee base that they'll say if it's a qualified 501c3, they'll match dollar for dollar up to a certain percent. I know that some organizations went and said, you know what, during this time frame, 
if you give to specific, not for, not even specific, not for profits, but like the ones that are, that you truly support, we'll give you one and a half times the amount we will match dollar for dollar out to the not for profit that you support. So, I mean, even Karen, to your point of like, yes, the corporate sponsorships too, but don't forget even like discussing with the corporations themselves about, about their employee base and the gift matching that they do with them. There's a lot of good organizations out there. Right. While we're on the topic of events, um, we have another writing question from Mackenzie Bartels. Um, the question is, events are fun, but I'm curious about the return on revenue. You can say it looked successful because it was enjoyable, but how much did the organization raise versus what they spent? So, I mean, I can give a, a broad example. I sit on three different uh, nonprofit boards, and uh, one nonprofit had, a, had to shift from an in-person conference um, earlier this uh, fall. And um, while you shift to video or, or a virtual conference, um, you know, your costs go down. Um, so you adjust your budget accordingly. Um, and I think they can still be profitable um, based, based on that. I, I sense maybe Deborah would have um, some more insight. Thanks, Karen. Karen sits on All Philanthropy Ohio's board, and we did shift our, our conference um, to virtual this year. I will say, though, and as we're starting to look at, you know, what is the potential for next year and whether or not we'll have to be virtual again and looking at those costs and the lessons we learned through having a virtual conference this year, um, investment in the, the technology and the platform that allows us to really, you know, bring the experience that our, our, our participants are looking for um, is an investment that we'll have to make. And so seeing how while we're we're not having the same in-person costs of food and, and, and the space and overnight rooms that may go along with a multi-day conference. Um, there is going to be some investment in the technology. And so the question that we're raising now too is, you know, where, the, where will the sponsorships come in and where will um, the registrations land? So there's a lot to be learned through, through this year that we will take taking into planning for next year. And so let's... Go ahead. I think real quick, there there are some um, ROI. Uh, there's some information on ROI on different types of fundraising that you can find online. And I think the the important thing is what is yours, right? Like what is your true uh, return on investment of your events, of your grant seeking, of your individual fundraising? Therefore, where is it best? You have the best use of your limited resource of time. Great. So, so as we're talking about virtual events, um, it's been my experience that probably your largest donors, those that give the most, tend to be of an older population that might be challenged with technology such as virtual events. What are you guys seeing in that realm? Has this created additional challenges for donors to participate in these virtual events? I think that's more, so it's funny that you say that because I've it's literally going old school, picking up the phone and calling your donors <laughs> and actually not communicating through email or technology like that. But the, the older donors that are more comfortable, I know a, a lot of, uh, a lot of not-for-profits that I work with, they, they're older donors. They still want them to know that they're there and that they, they under, they understand the communication and the relationship that they have with that donor. So a lot of them just are, are going back to picking up the phone. If they and can't that, attend that virtual event, I mean, they'll talk them through it. And that said, too, I think that, you know, don't write off a donor until you find out, right? I think that people are becoming, they had to, right, become tech savvy real quick. I mean, we're, visit, we're visiting our doctors on our phones, you know, my parents are doing these things. So I think that, um, you know, I think don't write, a, don't write them off. You know, I think that it's becoming much more uh, a normal thing. Yeah, I, I have to agree with Lauren and um, just because their hair may be a certain color doesn't mean they can't do technology. <laughs> no, we, we've had a series of, uh, of sessions now on our advancing mm -hmm. side with a number of our donors around racial equity and criminal justice. And there's been every, yes, they've been probably the average age is over 50, but everybody's participating. Um, maybe they have a granddaughter or a grandson who's helping them but please do not write anybody off. People have had to figure out how to get online for some portion of the day. Um, and many of them who have funds to give have the means to figure out how to do that. Right. So 
staying with events, just um, one last question. We, uh, you know, a lot of organizations have really had to think outside the box on how to keep in touch with their donors. Um, what has what has maybe surfaced under the COVID umbrella that you think are going to carry into best practices for 2021 and beyond? What can we take away from what we've been experiencing these last eight months? I would think nonprofits, seriously. Um, I think they all very quickly learned about a contingency plan and whether or not they had one in place. And to keep, because if they didn't have a contingency plan in place, they learned really quickly how to pivot to move their employees from work from home to be able to still communicate with either their beneficiaries um, that are calling and looking for some information, what they'll keeping their programs alive in their communities because they're so important. That's the number one thing. I think everyone now at this point has buttoned up, if not are close to buttoning up, a contingency plan should something like this happen again. Yeah, Technology. I think, <laughs> yeah, and I also think um, a lot of uh, what some nonprofits probably have realized is that they can rely maybe more on their boards or their volunteers. Um, or as I mentioned earlier, if they have a diminished staff, how do they then look outside of their organization to get that uh, specialty that they need, website design or communications needs? And there are organizations um, in Cleveland uh, there's uh, Business Volunteers Unlimited. I think, Dale, we talked about that the other day um, that does have uh, seasoned professionals that are willing to lend their skills. So that might be another thing that they think about is how do they use outside help for those um, staff positions that they've had to let go of. I'd say the, you know, that the word pivot is probably gonna be one of the number one words for 2020. Um, and I'd say for most nonprofits and maybe for some businesses, cross training is going to be another one. Right. Because you just can't rely. People had to. People had different modes of operating once they went home, right? Some have kids. Some have elderly people that they're you know they're doing their work, but they have to do them in in all sorts of ways. So it means you sometimes can't rely on that one staff person to do that one task. You need others to understand to to fill in. To be frank. Um, and so this kind of cross training and people all understanding um, a little bit of what everybody's got to do. So if we got, need somebody to fill in, you have that opportunity, that ability, I think it's going to be really important going forward in general, COVID or no COVID. And I'm going to steal your word, Dale, and I'm going to pivot. Um, we talked about COVID, um, but we haven't really touched on political um, and social issues. So let's completely shift gears. Let's talk about racial inequality. This is a broad question for the group. Um, and we, um, I don't want to say a touchy one, but be a little bit one that's more sensitive. Is there a role for nonprofits to play in the area of racial equality? Maybe a slightly different way to look at that question would be, should they play a role or should they just stay in their lane and focus on the different areas that they uh, support and support? Um, I'd like to jump in here. I mean, the, the crisis of racial inequality is heightened now and inter intertwined, as we discussed, with COVID, as well as with the economic impact. And so addressing it right now is really not an option. Not addressing it, I should say, is not an option. Um, we, it has to be addressed. Um, being intentional about policies and practices is key. Conducting a review of all the policies an organization has can, also, can start with, at the top level, the board diversity policy. Um, outlining, you know, what are the organization's values around diversity so that um, if those are complete, you really should start getting those, get those done um, now. Um, and calling for the intentional way you want to build your board, but not just stopping with getting a diverse board. What is the culture on the board? What is the, what is the experience that people of color feel and, and have when they are engaging as a board member? Um, and then deliberately, you know, not just recruiting, but also um, for those that are already represented, you know, having a commitment to creating that culture, but also to continue to learn. You know, this is not a sort of, none of us knows all that we need to know about um, racial equity and what we need to do now. It's a learning journey for all of us. Um, and meeting and letting people show up where they are, right? Some are on the beginning of their journeys and some are, are much further along. And the more diverse your board is, the more um, generative conversations you can have at that, at that leadership level. 
Um, but then it's also important to hear from staff and understand what are what are they experiencing, what are the efforts that they're doing. Um, they are on the ground most likely um, with those efforts. And you know, so that leadership from the top um, down to staff, and then also engaging your community members, your ultimate, who, who are you serving? Uh, making sure their voices are, are a part of the solutions that you might be coming up with. Um, it has to be all together in that, um, but it really has to come, leadership has to be involved and it really has to set the tone for the rest of the organization. You know, and I just add to what Deborah said that in the end, nonprofits are about solving problems and serving people on the ground, no matter what area you're in. Um, and what we've learned, uh, I mean, we knew it anyway, it's just been made bare more in the last six months, is that to be frank, some of the people we're serving, we're not serving them well enough. And so yes, it is incumbent upon most nonprofits, probably all, to think through where are they on that learning journey, partly just to make sure you're fulfilling your mission. Um, and we at the foundation are starting to ask those questions even more. Um, because the bottom line is we're not getting the results that we need to see. Um, and so in order to, when you, when you look at that as the problem, you look at all aspects of the problem. And one aspect of the problem is, do you know the clients that you're serving? We know you get better results when you have staff and board that represent the clients that you are serving. If you're not doing that, you need to do that. You need to do it very soon. Mm -hmm. Are you listening to your clients? We know that voice matters. It's a part of building their development and part of you understanding what is really going on in their lives. If you're not doing that, you need to find a way to do it. Um, and now foundations are gonna start asking for that a lot more. I know we're gonna be doing that. Um, so I would say it's, it's both a personal issue, right? Because it's just a part of our society, something we need to be addressing, but also professionally, as if you are at staff or leading a nonprofit and you are working with all types of people, by the way, it doesn't have to, have to be black and brown people. Um, it's how are you listening to them? How are you doing things differently so that we can help solve some of these intractable problems? That you probably can't do alone. You have to do with others. Right, Dale, yeah, that was very impactful. Thank you. I want to share some statistics um, really around that new subject. So on BVU, uh, Business Volunteers Unlimited did a survey in July of this year. 58% of the organizations that responded acknowledged that they diversity, equity, and inclusion practice and policies, only 17% indicated they were satisfied with where their organization was at. So I think a big question is, is, is when you feel that you're really off the mark, where do you even start? Deborah, I'm gonna throw this one at you for a minute, then Dale, I'd love for you to add on. Um, what is step one that you would recommend for an organization if they really wanted to make diversity inclusion um, to 2021, where do they start? Well, I think I, you know, mentioning the, the, and someone asked, I think a question in the, in the, in the chat or on the board diversity statements. And so I might start with an organization called Board Source. Um, they have lots of resources um, that are particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion also. Um, there's a lot, um, equity, ec racialequitytools.org, I believe also has tons of resources and examples um, that can be used across types of organizations. Um, but really starting, and if, and if you really haven't done the work, you might consider um, working with a consultant to have someone, particularly the internal work. We, we did an assessment last year um, that had us look at what we were doing externally, but also what we were doing internally. And we saw, found that we actually um, were doing great on both accounts, but we're doing better externally. So we really had to turn inward and, and we have an internal staff working group right now looking to, to determine what can we do um, for staff internally. Um, but, and, and I've let them know, you know, if your recommendation is that we might need to have to bring a consultant in, we'll find the resources to do that because it's so important to have someone um, to help guide that process. Because as you said, Tracy, it can become um, a touch, touchy experience for some folks to, to enter in. Not everyone's comfortable having the conversations, um, but I think we can all get there. Um, and and if, if the leadership supports that and is, is willing to put some, some resources behind that. And I'm starting to see more and more funders starting to put resources behind that. I can give you one exa example of a, um, a foundation that took the internal journey, had their board and staff um, do the Racial Equity Institute trainings, and then have come so far as to now be bringing those trainings to their community, but also tying it to grants, saying when you get a grant, you make a commitment that your leadership will go through um, racial equity training too. 
So it, everything from, you know, the policies to really living it and what are you going to do to, to actualize and operationalize um, your policies and your goals. I would say in, conju in conjunction with that, one of the tools that uh, nonprofits can use is creating board term limits. So that, that creates an opportunity for you to have to go out and find new members for your board in the community, as opposed to allowing members who have been great, great board members and great partners for your organization to sit on the board for, for longer and longer, as opposed to get that new blood, those new ideas in, uh, which again, just creates that opportunity to bring in diversity, to bring in generational change uh, into your organization and refresh uh, your mission, refresh your thoughts and, and help you move forward in your community outreach. I just, oh, oh, go ahead, Lauren. Um, I, I was going to switch gears. So you go ahead, Karen. I would just, I can't agree more with the term limits. Uh, and I, and I would also say the board governance and nominating committee, I think needs to be built uh, as a diverse committee as well. So even if, um, you know, uh, some organizations build their committees, not just with their board members, but bringing in um, uh, other uh, future potential board members to serve on committees to learn more about the organization. And um, certainly having your governance and your nominating committee uh, as diverse as possible to help identify those future board members to help um, diversify your board. And I, I would just add that we, you see some examples in the chat of local resources. Um, Neighborhood Connections will come in and help you. Uh, Third Space Action Lab, Facing History and Ourselves, they're all locally resourced um, organizations that will help you as an organization think through what you want to do. But you know, when I, when I think about the first thing to do is if you are a nonprofit or a business and you want to add on a new strategy or a new activity, you take it very seriously. It's something that is not just an add-on. You're not just going to add it on to the last 10 minutes of a, of a staff meeting. You're going to think through very logically board, um, staff, external relations, donors, clients, within all of those different areas, what are you doing differently around equity and diversity and inclusion? You have to define that. You have to think through what does, how does this add to the, or, or add to the values that we've already espoused for our organization? Where does this fit? Why should we be doing this? That's some deep work. It is not what some people think of as just an add-on. We're going to do this in two months. We're going to come up with a strategy and we'll be done. It is never done. It is always something that should be integral to what you do as a nonprofit. And you're always going to be refreshing it. And you're always going to be thinking about, I'm doing it well this way. I'm not doing it well. How do I get the information to know if I'm doing well? I would start there. Treat it as something that is incredibly important and that will be ongoing. And then you, you'll, you'll decide, this year I'm going to focus on the staff. Next year I'm going to focus on the board. You probably can't do it all at one time, to be honest. But the point is, it's that important that it needs to be something that's built into what you do on a regular basis. That is where I would start to think about it. You're right, Dale. They need to be intentional about it. And really, like you said, you can't, it's, it's put it into buckets. What is important? Start with your staff, move to your donors and go from there. But I think also we've had a lot of great information just between the panelists and, and what I'm seeing in the chat come up. I think we should share that out to everybody afterwards at these, yeah. these websites that you can go to, to help because the small and not for profit, whether you're a small not for profit or a large not for profit, it may be overwhelming. You want to do the right thing. And you like, it's, it is the time to do it be intentional, reach out for help. There's a lot of organizations out there that can help you build policy um, around what you need to be doing here. I wanna share one more, which is about listening to those you serve. So the funders, they really, I mean, in many ways, the funders are, uh, set the tone for us. And someone mentioned the power dynamic that exists, which it's true, right? Um, you know, not as nonprofits, we're beholden to our funders in, in many ways. And so what they tell us to do or what they do, you know, we want to, we want to do. Um, but, you know, they, they really do write by us in some ways. And one of those is this thing that was a collaboration of funders a number of years ago called the Fund for Shared Insight. Um, they put together a program called Listen for Good. And it was all about listening to those you serve and how you make, how, how you can, um, 
um, you know, make sure that your programs are meeting the needs of the community. There is a huge learning community around it. Someone asked about it in the chat. It's one resource to go to. Um, it, was, it, it was across the country. Um, really smart, good stuff there for, for listening to those that you serve. I wanted to also add, um, Dale had the great list of all the constituents, but I want to add um, vendors. So um, Flint, Ohio just approved a vendor diversity policy earlier this year. And again, it's not as if we're going to all, all of a sudden just switch every, how we do everything, but it set a goal for us to look at what percentage of the money that we're spending um, in, in the services and, and to vendors can we target and be intentional about. And then it's not just setting the policy, it's like, how are we going to do that, right? And then now having to, to think about and reach out to others who who have done and are doing it to find out okay what what are your best what are the best practices and how do we how do we do this um, and how do we hold ourselves accountable and circle back to that and the other piece that I want to emphasize is that it is integral to everything you do it can't be siloed it can't be we're going to have this committee over here and they're going to look at this and it has to be integrated with everything that you do and for the last couple of years we had our diversity committee meeting with our member services basically our programs committee for two years to say, we can't have you all talking over here and you all talking over here. It has to be integrated. And those conversations came into the boardroom as well. And so we really were, as I can quote one of our, our um, great board members, um, developing a muscle memory about how do we do this so that it becomes automatic and not sort of that add on extra thing. We, we try to check the box and say, we did it. It becomes how part of who we are and how we do our work. And that takes time and it takes intention. And it's culture shift, but it can happen, but not until you get started and, and work and lean into it and work through the when it gets kind of icky and uncomfortable and hard. Keep going. Good advice. Um, there, there's a statistic that show that the number of people of color who approach boards is significantly lower um, than those of non-color. And I believe we kind of touched on this subject during one of our planning calls for today's webinar. And that's the idea that because the pool of candidates, people of color for boards is smaller, the same people get tapped over and over and over for board involvement. What can we do to increase the size of that? Pool? You know, you've got to think outside the box. Um, I know, and I understand, because I used to work for a nonprofit. I know the way most, most nonprofits put their boards together is they want people of means or expertise on that board. And I was on an, I was working at a nonprofit where there was a third category and that third category was just as important than those first two. And that was lived experience. And so if you are not, I don't care what nonprofit you are, you have clients that have lived experiences. Some of those people can go on your board <laughs> and help diversify your board. Um, if you can't find people in those other, I, I think you can find people in those other two categories too. Um, it, it takes, I literally just got recruited to a board because my alumni association, a person I know through that connected me to somebody in a whole nother state, but they know what I'm interested in and it turned out to be a perfect fit. Um, and she purposely reached out to her alumni board for her college to say, I'm trying to find people, please help me. It doesn't matter what state they're in because now we're all virtual. So there are ways to do this, but there shouldn't be one person recruiting for the board, first of all. You've got to think about wealth, expertise, and lived experience. And with all of those three, you can find a way to diversify your board. Mm -hmm. okay. Our wonderful colleague, Kimberly St. John Stevenson shared, uh, the pool is not smaller. Nonprofits need to find new and different places to find candidates. That's right, that's right. I'll say if, you, if your organization is intentionally um, addressing racial equity, you will attract more folks who want to be engaged with the work that you're doing and not and folks who have the means to be givers as well as give of their time and talent, um, but to also give of their treasure. And um, but it, it, yeah, as Dale said, you, you, there, you've got to do the work. You can make the connections and reach outside of your comfort zone and your, your, your current networks. And there are some there are some programs that are particular um, training. Um, folks of color to be not on board members. I know here in Central Ohio, um, the United Way does that. I, I believe BBU is also doing some of that work. So, um, so there are there are ways to um, to reach out through those more or formal organized efforts as well. And, and I think that can apply to not just uh, racial diversity but generational diversity. I saw one of the questions yeah. in the box where someone was talking about how can you be more proactive in social media? How can you broaden your donor base from that perspective? 
while looking at candidates that are younger than your generational or your typical makeup of a board that might not have the means or wealth that uh, some of your other members do, but have expertise or lived experience in other areas. I mean, I know from personal experience in trying to find boards to work with where, you know, I'm not able to potentially give, give as much as they want, but I bring that expertise that could help a board grow and, and thrive in other areas. So I, I think it's kind of broadening just beyond what you've typically done in the past and looking for, for other ways to improve uh, your mission and your strength as an organization. You know, I love the organizations that have kind of junior boards. That doesn't have to be just for certain types of organizations. Everybody can have that. There should be a pipeline um, in general, and you sometimes have to grow your own pipeline. So think about, I love that generational one. People don't think about a 26 year old being on a board. They can be on a board. They have incredible energy. <laughs> you probably need them for the tech world anyway. Um, so think, just think broadly. <laughs> Good information. And believe it or not, we are already at 10 minutes after the hour. So we only have 20 minutes left together. And, and I want to definitely make sure we have time for Q&A. And we haven't even touched on the political landscape, really. So I'm going to turn this question over to Marvin. Um, what are your concerns or what do you think are potential concerns around the upcoming election and its effect on the nonprofit? Uh, maybe set us up with some market commentary and economic overview. Uh, depending on who might win uh, the election in New York. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. It's one we get a lot from, from our clients. And it's, we think of election, again, as a short term. The biggest concern that we have is not which party is in the, is in the White House. It's really that idea of, of lack of clarity. So if the election draws out for several months into January, into February, and it's contested, that's the type of environment where you're going to see the market you know, perform poorly and you're going to see volatility rise. But if we get clarity, you know, companies and markets, they don't care which, which party is in the White House. Companies are able to thrive regardless of whether it's Democratic or Republican White House and Congress. They just want clarity to be, clarity to be able to establish proper tax policies, proper growth policies to understand how they can invest in their business and help them grow. So again, we think of it as a short-term event. Uh, one that you shouldn't react to in your portfolios. You just need to understand the risk that you have while talking with your advisor. And historically, actually, when we look at it, November and December after an election have been the strongest months on average um, in, in a given year. So, you know, that's been more historical where elections were typically decided in one or two days. Now with mail-in voting, I mean, we're already expecting the, the winner to be announced several days later as those votes get canceled get counted. So there's really going to be a little volatility around that, but we, you shouldn't move your, your investment portfolio. You shouldn't react around those concerns uh, and really have that long-term view, which is your role as a fiduciary. And if, you know, the election gives you an opportunity, take advantage of it by reallocating portions of your portfolio to take advantage of a drawdown in equities or, or something of that nature. So it's, it's a great time to have a conversation with your advisor, understand the risks, but know that longer term, uh, you know, our country has thrived, our stock market has thrived uh, through various uh, Democratic and Republican presidents. And I think we're going to continue to do that into the future. Great. Any other thoughts from the rest of the panel? You know, I would just add, regardless of, of who wins on November 3rd, um, or whenever we get an, we get, whenever we get an answer, um, I hope that many foundations who didn't do this before, but after COVID, realize that they have to understand policy issues. Foundations are realizing that who normally just did direct service and didn't get into policy. Policy really affects everything we do. And so if you, even if you don't have staff um, dedicated to that in particular, there are so many different um, associations or groups locally, federally, that you should at a minimum be a member of or be aware of what they're doing be able to give examples of when policies have helped or hurt your clients. We need your voices at the state house, at the city, city council, um, at the federal level to explain to elected leaders what really happens on the ground and what doesn't. They try hard, but to be honest, many times they miss the mark. And so I hope you are understanding that it's not just about your vote, of course that's important, but it's also about your voice and your voice as a nonprofit community matters. 
but we don't often, sometimes we're so busy doing the direct service. I know that's important. We don't think we have time to go to Columbus and testify or send a letter to say, that's not really helping my constituency. We need you to do that too. That's important. Um, and there are so many people, the other side has lots of money and they spend it <laughs> to influence policymakers. We need to do the same thing on the nonprofit side. So um, I would just say, I hope people are thinking about how to get involved in that way no matter who wins this next election. And by the way, it does not matter if it's the election you want, you still, we still need your voice. They're gonna to have to make tough decisions going forward. So your voice still matters. Dale, I think that is a great way and the formal part of our discussion. And I'm gonna close out the panel um, with asking each of you a question again. We opened it up with each of you responding. We're gonna close it down with each of you responding to one final question. Um, so if you were a nonprofit leader, and for Deborah, since you are a nonprofit leader, what would you tell other leaders as they think about and plan for 2021 and beyond? What's the one thing that you'd recommend they start doing or stop doing to be in better position to be successful going forward? And we'll start um, looking at my cameras. I'm going to start with Cindy in the upper corner. Cindy, what would you say? Absolutely. So uh, my one recommendation and you really need to put thought into is understanding your budget, where your revenue is coming from, the resources around it and what you need to plan on in 2021, because it is different from what you just went through in 2020 and from what you happened in 2019. So really put thought around where your revenue is going to be coming from. And then to I think it was Dale's point that cross training your staff, you know, strong infrastructure, strong nonprofit. Awesome. Marvin, let's turn it over to you next. I'm going to carry on a little bit of what Cindy said is, is by examining your budget and understanding what your organization is spending, you can use that information to help you direct your investment portfolio, restructure your investment portfolio to continue to meet that, that changing or required spend rates. And, and it really begins again, and I can't stress this enough with the idea of revisiting your investment policy statement with your advisor understanding what your organization needs on a go forward basis and how to get it. I mean, the, the past we don't believe is going to set you up for future success and having those conversations and reshifting is, is probably the most important thing that you can do, not just for 2021, because we don't really ever invest for one year, but for the next five to 10 years, uh, continued success. Perfect. Lauren, how about you? I would say relationships, you know, no, no matter what happens, you know, in this, in the next six months, the relationships that you have with your funders are, are going to be important. They're going to remain important. And so I think no better use of time of an executive director or a chief development officer could be spent than, than meeting with your top 10 foundation donors or meeting with your top 10 uh, individual donors or your top 20 if you have extra time. And, you know, really having a two way, tr you know, building trust with them, having a two way conversation, hearing from them what's important to them. And when it comes to your institutional donors, your foundation donors, really understanding how your organization, what role it plays in the ecosystem that that foundation cares about is, is just critically important to the, to the communication you have with them. Thanks, Lauren. Dale, what about you? What would you say? Well, in addition to all of that, I, I agree completely. Um, you know, I would actually add two things, if you don't mind. Um, one is an organization is only as good as its staff. And our staffs are burdened, just like our clients. And so if I'm an ED, I want to make sure I know what are the, what's, what's my staff ready and prepared to take on in 2021? What issues do they have, to be frank, that they have to deal with while we're still at home that could impede the work that I need them to do. How can I help them with self-care? Um, that is equally important. You have to put on your own mask first. Um, and so I, I would care a lot about where, where's my staff in this moment and how are they seeing 2021 and how, how's it gonna affect them? And, and the other thing I would say is that we're not in this alone. One of the things that we're seeing a lot of and we hope we see more of in 2021 is more collaboration. You as one organization cannot solve everybody's issues. You cannot. You working with seven other groups can think through a neighborhood strategy or a sector strategy um, or a, you know, a year long strategy. We're looking for those types of collaborations because to be frank, we need them. My funding you is only gonna help 20 people in one block. 
my funding seven of you could help a whole neighborhood really figure out how to manage through this craziness that we're in. And so I would say, look to your peers and your partners, who's around you? Who can you work with in order to address some of the issues you're trying to address? Great advice. Karen, what about you? Um, like Dale, I would say all of the above. And, um, and I think it's probably uh, much of what Dale said, but really looking at the time that you have and using that time the most wisely that you can so that means don't spend it if you're not aligned to Lauren's uh, earlier point. If you're not, if your mission is not aligned with a funder's focus, um, don't try to put a square peg in a round hole. Just accept and and move forward. Pivot, fluid, um, move forward. I think those are themes that we need to think about, and I think being proactive too. So. You know, as it's the fall, um, I'm in the process of building my budget for 2021. I think others are probably. It's not unusual to get a call from a nonprofit uh, uh, leader or a development officer to say, you know, are we, are we able to be on your budget for next year? What does that look like? How are you feeling? Um, and having those conversations, of course, those relationships are pivotal to having those um, authentic and honest um, conversations. And Deborah, I put you in the unfortunate last seat to round this all out. So Deborah, what, what, what would you share? So I will say yes and. <laughs> um, and, and yes, as a nonprofit leader, um, we are in the midst of our, our um, budgeting and planning process for next year. And no one has a crystal ball. There's so much unknown and we're doing some scenario planning, you know, so if this happens, then that, you know, how long will we be only offering virtual engagement and programs? Um, you know, have, so having a policy, we're gonna do this when, if and when we're able, or um, if we're not able for the entire year, this is what this would look like and, plan and planning for that upfront and, you know, you know, trying to balance optimism with reality, um, but also I think it's important to have an, a, a mindset of abundance. And mm -hmm. I know as opposed to poverty and scarcity, and I know that that always doesn't mean that you have the resources of, in abundance, but how you approach, how you look at the work, I think is, is, is important for, you know, the, the courageous decisions that you're gonna have to ask your board and, and for your staff to be able to make. Um, and thinking of it from an, an abundance mindset that, you know, there, you know, we need these resources to do this work and we'll find it. Um, and, 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 in, and empowering um, your staff and your board to help you raise the money and, and to do what you need to do. Um, and, and to take all of the things we've heard today into, into that planning for, um, for next year. And I just want to, I really personally want to wish everyone well. Um, and to Dale's point, wellness and self-care in, in the midst of all of this, it's difficult stuff. Um, but, please, but just hope that everyone um, is taking care of themselves and their staff. Awesome. Well, I wanna thank all of our panelists today. That was certainly a lot of great information. Um, I see by the chat uh, screen that we are getting some questions that are coming in for the Q&A portion. And we're gonna take a, just a brief break here as we let the audience members submit some additional questions. And while they do that, Matt, can you share our polling question? Perfect. So you'll see on the screen in front of you, um, there's a variety of topics um, that we're um, considering for future events. Um, to vote on your favorite, all you have to do is click the circle in front of the event or the topic that you find most interesting and you'd like to hear more about. You can choose as many as, as you like. And when you're done, just commit, uh, uh, click the submit button at the bottom. Um, we'll give everyone about 30 seconds to complete the survey. And then Matt, would you be able to share the final results with everyone? I will, yeah. Tracy, while we're waiting, I just want to say one thing. So as we were going through this, this great panel discussion, and I am honored to be with all of you today, there was one quote, I, I, I didn't write down the panel, uh, the 
person's name, but she said it was a quote from Isabella Wilkerson and said, America is an old house and we can never declare the work over. I thought that was a great quote and I just wanted to make sure that everybody was able to see that because truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Matt, do we have our results ready? Or do we still have people who haven't voted? Awesome. So it looks like effective online fundraising and tactics is the number one um, choice followed closely by broadening your fundraising pr prospect pipeline. Looks like money raising is the number one topic. This is incredibly helpful. Um, great feedback from our audience. Um, I wanna thank you for that. We'll be sending out information on our next event um, as soon as details are finalized. Um, just to give you a heads up, we are targeting early first quarter for the next webinar, so stay tuned for that. Thank you for that, Matt, very helpful. So let's go on to um, the write-in Q&A. Um, we have a question from Ron Henline. Um, Given the surge of giving to rapid response funds in the spring, do any of you feel that end of the year fundraising will see a huge fall off? So we're, we're um, I'll start. Um, we are not seeing that yet. Um, we have structured our COVID phase two for people who don't know as a year long uh, effort instead of a few month effort, which we did in phase one. So we already know there's some foundations who are ready to give for us in January, 2021 um, to that effort. They've already made that clear. So, you know, it's, it's, you still have to do your research. Um, there are some people who have spent most of their budgets for 2020, um, but they, that's what they would have spent anyway. Um, it's just the timing of when it was spent. Um, they're very ready to get back in the game in January 2021. And so we're hoping that they will uh, use the COVID fund as one of their vehicles to do that. So I wouldn't assume anything yet. Um, I really think it is, unfortunately, you still got to do the work and the research and the relationship building to know where everybody is. I think people are in different spaces. Great. I certainly wouldn't assume either. I would just say, you know, um, it, it, we come from a, a America. We just talked about it. it we're at a we're at a barn raising tradition. People want to help people, and I think this was an opportunity. This crisis was an opportunity for people to step up who wanted to do that. And I think we, you know, don't assume that they're not going to uh, step up at the end of the year as well. Can I just add, so many nonprofits are focused just on foundations because I know it's easier to get large sums of, dumb, so, 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 um, sums of money from them. But remember, individuals still give the most of the money. You have to figure out a way to have an individual giving campaign and, or con connections with individuals in some way, shape or form. I know it's not easy. Some of us don't have you know, alumni that go on to make lots of money, right? You're always working with people with less means but there are people who want to give to you. You just have to find a way to connect to them. You can't be a nonprofit and only rely on foundations. It is impossible, I think, going forward. You've got to figure out a way to get yourself known through virtual or other ways to connect to individuals in addition to. You need both. Individuals dig deep right now to give. Foundations have set budgets. Individuals, you can always find more. There are many ways to do that, but you've got to devote some time and energy to doing it and maybe getting some help to doing it. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I apologize to those that are submitting questions. They're coming in fast and we're just not going to have time. Um, the last one, it's an anonymous question. Has there been a push to fund capacity building for organizations led by people of color to address the historical and systemic challenges they have faced over the years. And a second part to that is a multiple year engagement could be a way to help them grow in addition to their program, uh, programmatic efforts. Any comments or thoughts? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, at least for Northeast Ohio, uh, the Cleveland Foundation is gonna be working with other partners. We're just the start. Um, we've announced a Black Futures Fund. Um, it's gonna be supporting black led and black, black led, organizations that are black led and black serving. Um, to, those, to those groups, um, they'll probably start putting dollars out in early 2021. Um, but that is one of the ways many community foundations and other foundations, by the way, are segmenting some of their dollars to support that particular work. Um, we're also probably gonna also be doing a Latinx fund because um, we don't wanna just talk about just black people. Um, but yes, um, there is a lot of push um, in the foundation world to think through how to rectify what has been a historical wrong 
um, which is that some of those black and brown led organizations are not getting the same amount of dollars that others have. And I will just say in general, for us, um, for the Cleveland Foundation, we think capacity building is still very important. So when you come in for a general operating grant, it might be some of that is capacity building. That's okay. Like someone said, strong infrastructure, strong nonprofit. And so if you're thinking about capacity, that's what your need is, please still come to us. We're absolutely still interested in supporting that. And yes, we're seeing that from funders across the state, um, in Columbus and Cincinnati, Toledo, but also in some of the smaller um, community foundations um, and, and, and the counties across the state that are all um, establishing funds um, for just that effort. So, and more, more to come. Um, Perfect. Well, we are right at 1.30, and this has really been an information-packed afternoon. Um, a big thank you to our distinguished group of panelists um, for their participation in today's discussion. A special thank you to our audience for carving time out of your busy day to join us. We hope you found today's event to be meaningful to you, your organization, and your mission. As a reminder, this event has been recorded, and replay information will be sent out. Um, as will information on our next event. On the screen before you is the contact information for all the panelists that were involved in today's discussion. I want to thank everyone again and I uh, wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.